This landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico. The rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. Brazil was the man who discovered the chopper. What I thought was a star began coming in my direction at a very rapid uh, rate of speed. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. I saw a UFO and it went down the river, turned right at the United Nations, turned left and then down the river. UFO classified. UFO classified. No more plausible deniability. Fact. Fiction. Or the truth. You decide. And now, the new voice of the high desert, the hostess of UFO classified. Erica Lukes. Oh, well, happy Fantopia Friday, my friends. I am Erica Lukes, and this is KCOR, the best digital broadcasting network on the planet. I have to say a little thanks to my wonderful producer, Tina Marie, who runs an exceptional station. And every time I'm, I'm here, I have to say that because she's so dedicated and professional and works so hard to make all of us sound good and to try to keep me in line, which I know some days is a bit tough, but I want to thank her and everybody at KCOR. My show tonight is going to be very exciting because it is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. I will be joining my friend and fellow Skywatcher, Charles Lamaru and Scott Brown here in just a minute. But I want to give a shout out to my friends in the chat room, Northern UFOs, Jeff Cox, all the way over in Japan, having a good time. And Susan Wayne Miller, all of you guys from all over the world. I appreciate your support. And it makes me happy to know every week that I can come here and I've got such positive people with good feedback and contributions and people that also understand that integrity is vital in this field. I want to also briefly say that it is very important to remember in this field that there are many brave men and women who for decades have sacrificed and risked their families and financial situations and reputations. And they have come forward with their names very publicly and have taken a lot of heat and they're, they need to be honored and remembered. In this time, we are seeing a lot of really detrimental things with the all of the Facebook pages, all of the bullying that takes place on a daily basis. I want to remind all of you that it, it's very easy to get caught up in that. I have to step back. But there are good people out here, like my two guests tonight, that are dedicated to finding the truth, and they're dedicated to being kind and exceptional human beings. With that said, let's get on to the show, because we're going to talk about some orange orbs. So this is exciting, and my guest tonight is super cool. I met him at the MUFON Symposium a couple years ago. He has got a brand new film out. that is. He's going to talk to us a little bit more about that. He's captured some stunning images in the Vancouver, British Columbia skies. He's an avid sky watcher, amateur astronomer, and a former skeptic who now understands that, yes, there are unidentified objects in our skies that more often than not fly around undetected. He is dedicated to getting equipment, state-of-the-art equipment, and teaching people, empowering people. I commend him for that. Charles, what is happening? Oh, hi. How are you? Well, what an introduction. <laughs> Holy. Love it. Thank you. <laughs> well, I know you'll live up to it. I mean, it's true. I always, I have a few people in this field that I just really adore and I learn so much from and I can always message you and bounce things off of you. And I think it, it that's really important because we're trying to learn what this is and we're trying to deal with new technology and you're always very helpful. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. And, and um, you know, it was great when I first met you there a couple of years ago at the symposium. And that photograph I still use for our, our company meetings. And I uh, get all these people looking at me. Who's this Erica? UFO spe a specialist? What is she? What's UFO? What's that? I mean, it was so hilarious. And I brought that up at our national sales meeting last year. It, it's hilarious. And then, so I get a lot of questions from a lot of people at work today. 
And of course, uh, with my manager, it doesn't go, uh, it doesn't come across very well, but people I work with are pretty cool. Well, you know, that's good. And that brings up an, an important point. It's funny to see how, how people react to this subject. And I, I had to be really careful when I first started talk, to talking about it. And I still do to a point, I just know how to, to maybe word things a little bit better, or when to not even bring it up. You can tell when somebody's kind of shut down. But but how have you, with your documentary and all of this stuff, how have you been adjusting to that? Well, it, it's it's been good. Um, again, we launched the first um, version of the documentary, which which was the original, was the French version, uh, because I'm I'm bilingual. So we launched it and it was broadcast a couple of months ago throughout Canada on the um, on the uh, national French station, and uh, we had really good reception from it uh, from the French community. And of course, um, we're waiting for uh, the broadcast. Hopefully, it'll be within the next few months, uh, either just in Canada and or United States as well. So hopefully North America wide uh, of the English version, because uh, that's the biggest uh, group of people that are going to watch it. And I'm really looking forward to that um, being broadcast. So I'll let you know for sure once we have a date. And I'm so excited. And you have to pronounce it for us in your accent. Okay. The French is uh, Les Lueurs dans le ciel. Okay, that basically loosely translates as lights in the sky in, in, the, in the translation for English. But the English version uh, is titled Nocturnal Lights. So it's a better, it's a better title. Um, so we didn't go directly with lights in the sky. It sounds better with nocturnal lights because oh that gosh. is a real phenomenon. It is, absolutely. In fact, I've got a, a book sitting right here about mm -hmm. nocturnal lights. You probably have the same thing, too. It's called Lightning Aurora's Nocturnal Lights. Yes. And it's yes. yes. Oh my gosh. And there's so many cool books about this when you start digging around. Oh yeah. There's there's so many resources out there. Uh if you look for it and find them. Um again, I've been doing astronomy for um a good part of oh gosh, almost 30 years now. Actually, no, it has been. <laughs> and basically and uh, definitely astronomy enthusiast. I, I love the skies, I love the stars. That's how I got involved in all this. I mean, I, I'm a total skeptic. I didn't believe in UFOs at all. I mean, I, I was, you know, I'm buying very expensive telescopes, looking at the stars, the moon, the planets, and you know, it just happened to um suddenly looking through my telescope, see a UFO. Uh, about six, seven years ago, and that's what got me into it. And I was a total skeptic. I had no idea what I was seeing. And I had a camera in the back of my, my telescope, and I could have taken a picture, but I was so amazed and stunned, and I didn't know what I was looking at. And, and a lot of people ask me, you know, what do UFOs look like? You'll know when you see one. And uh, that's basically, that's all I say, you know, and um, that was amazing. So that's what got me going. So what, so what did it look like when you were looking through your telescope? Well, this is the first, I'd say, the biggest craft that I've seen in terms of what I've been capturing over the last six years. But the first one was, it, it was a diamond shape. And today, I'm, I, I reflect back to how it looked like it could have been a triangle shape uh, object and just the way that it angled. But it was very huge. It went across the full moon. And I'm talking about, if you look at a full moon through a telescope and it zoomed in at about 10 times, let's say, because I was taking photographs of it, it was about an inch, inch and a, inch and a half um, uh, in size going across the moon. Oh, so Hail that, Mary, that was, that's a big one. Yeah, yeah, it was huge. And you know you know right away, it's not a kite. It's not anything that um, that's known because, um, you know, it's not a plane. Uh, it's not a bat. It's not anything like that that, you know, I can explain right away what it was. Because I had about three or four seconds as it crossed slowly across the moon to have a really good look at it. You know, I didn't have any detail in it at all. Um, but the fact that it, it didn't show up like a like a plane or anything that I'd say was man-made. And it would really, today, it still bothers me. And every time I tell, tell people this story, is I didn't take a photograph of it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I mean, I think that it, it, it's, A, it's hard to take photos at night, as you know. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. you know, you're under duress and you're trying to take the moment in. And there's always, you know, I mean, I'll have those kind of thoughts. Do I just sit here and look at this or do I get my camera out or yeah I mean it, it just there's a lot that goes through your mind I think and that it comes with you as you get further into this you can react a little bit better as you know and you're pretty good at reacting now Oh yeah now now I'm I'm pretty good at capturing them and I and I don't react at all anymore uh, in terms of wow th th there's one th th you know and 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 get the camera shaking everywhere I have everything on a tripod on a video uh, tripod head and so when I, when I finally capture one, I see one, you know, through one of my uh, cameras, you know, I'm panning and I'm following it. I'm zooming in and I'm 
taking all the readings as possible as I can. Um, you know, you get used to it. Like just like um, you know, when I had that blue orb, and again, we can talk about that later. But um, I still had that one in my head too, and that was two years ago, probably. Yeah, two years ago, almost to the day when I had that blue orb um, come close to my balcony. Um, so that one didn't surprise me at all. I mean, it surprised me that there is a blue orb by my balcony, but I stood still. I didn't go, whoa, freaking out and everything. I stood still. I looked at it. And I was ready to grab my camera as it zipped off and I grabbed my camera and I tried to zoom in on it and it, it kind of, um, um, balanced on top of a, uh, or hovered on top of a balcony or it's not a balcony, uh, building across from me. And as soon as I hit record on the button of my camera, it, it blinked out at the exact same time. So I didn't record it. So maybe I should just back up how it first started. Um, I was actually on my couch watching TV and I've taken off maybe, I think about three weeks off of sky watching. I was going every night and I was just tired of going out there and, and I had some lulls of like no, no uh, UFOs at all or any kind of action. So I was watching TV one night and, and all of a sudden I see in the side of my eye because I got the balcony window um, you know, facing me by where my TV is. And I see this blue light going up and down, up and down by the side of my balcony. And I thought it was someone with a quadcopter going up and down and looking in people's apartments. So I was getting a little mad because I have, I have a quadcopter myself. I have a multi-rotor and I'm into the hobby. I love it. I'm going to use it for capturing UFOs in the future. So, but I, you know, people looking inside your apartment, I was getting a little upset. So I ran up to my balcony and I couldn't see it. And all of a sudden, it's just this blue orb the size of a golf ball. It wasn't bigger than that. Maybe maybe a baseball. Again, it's between a golf ball and a baseball size. And it comes right up to eye level. And I'm talking about 10 feet away from my eye. I'm looking at this thing. It's not a quadcopter. <laughs> but I stayed very still. And I, I knew it was an orb. It was um, nothing from around here. And it, as soon as it, like, it's like it paid, it, it's like I looked at it and he was looking at me. I felt the, kind of like a presence and it zipped off. As soon as I felt that presence, it took off and it zigzagged across the street and about 300 meters um, across the street on top of the building. And that's when I ran inside my balcony, from my balcony to my apartment and I grabbed the camera and I tried to record it. And again, like I said, when I had it right in the lens and I hit the record button, it blinked out at the same time. So I didn't get any coverage at all of it. So I don't know if that was a coincidence or it knew that I was going to record it because it was a good seven seconds because I'm counting in my head how long this is going on for, right? Okay, here's the blue orb. I'm seeing it with my eyes. One second, two seconds, three seconds because you get used to this, you know, because you want to get as much data as possible and so much evidence. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm looking how it looks like. Okay, it's blue. That's it. There's no detail at all. I feel a presence. So I'm in my, med, in my mind. I'm taking this information and I'm counting how long this observation is going on for. And then when it zipped off, it zipped off like a bug. How a bug would take off, like going side to side, zip, 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 or even like a bat. And then when it went on top of the building, and I'm talking 300 meters away, it was still bright, very, very bright. And the next day, I kind of did a, uh, an analysis with a, um, a range finder. So I, I got the distance from it. And there was a person on top doing construction. The size of the blue light actually grew about the size of a big beach ball. So not only did it go from a golf ball size and zigzag across the street and travel so fast to get to the other side of 300 meters, it grew to the size of about a beach ball. And that is factual. That's, that blew my mind. Wow. So do you think that these little objects that are coming in close proximity to you, I mean, are they the same? Do you think that they could be the same thing that we see up in the sky? I think they're all related. Absolutely. Because I've seen them from um, the orange orbs, which we're going to, of course, talk about. Um, those are the first ones I've ever observed in white ones, completely transparent ones. I've seen a multicolored one um, about a couple of miles out with binoculars and descending on top of the tree line onto a power line. And it was changing colors. It was just multicolored rainbow. And then all of a sudden it, it, um, it ascended from the, uh, the telephone wire or power line. And as it ascended, it, it wasn't multicolored anymore. It was just a black dot in the sky. And it started ascending really fast, 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 and just, whoa, it took off and it was gone. That, that was pretty exciting as well. And, of course, it was a binoculars. I didn't have a camera at the time. Oh, my gosh. And, did, I mean, was it shocking to you once you had your initial sighting and then you have these other sightings to see how I mean, this is, is quite regular in a way when you start observing and you train yourself to see these objects? 
Yeah, um, when I first started back in 2011, around then, um, I didn't know what I was looking at to begin with. I started using night vision for the first time. Um, I was looking at bats, I was looking at satellites. It took a few months to actually get used to it, and I taught myself everything. But now today, I, I know what I'm looking at. I know what's uh, mundane and what's not. Um, I do a grid search. Uh, it's a specific way of um, going through the sky with uh, three cameras. I have two monitors, actually three monitors, and three cameras. And I do a grid search from one part of the sky to the other, up and down. I go pretty fast. And I know uh, how my cameras pick up the um, these orbs in terms of what to look for and what the satellites look like. So I can go pretty fast and scan the sky. So it, 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 you, you get used to it. Um, and you get to use, you know, what they look like. So I, I, that's why if you ever watch me do a sky watch, and I think we might have that opportunity in the future, you'll see that I pan the skies pretty quick and you're going to go, how the heck are you going to miss something? You go, no, you, you train your eye for it. You know what you're looking for. Wow. So I think that's, that's one way how I capture these because they're very rare. You know, you're not going to find dozens in the sky at one time. I mean, if you do, you're very lucky. I've, I've never seen someone actually, uh, uh, actually capture that in, in, in one night. I mean, I'll be lucky to see one uh, now today, um, I could maybe one every two or three months, but again, it's rainy season. I don't go out too often, only when it's clear, but when I first started, they were out, I'd say once every two or three days, I, I was capturing one or at least seeing one, uh, with night vision. It was like a flat time. It was like 2011 to 2013. It was so busy. That's why it was, uh, sky watching for hours and hours on end because you're almost guaranteed every night you would see one. But on average, I'd say every two or three nights, I would catch one zipping around the downtown core of Vancouver. And it was very interesting. They come from the ocean uh, at a pretty high altitude. I'd say, you know, it's hard to say how high, but about 80 degrees uh, from the horizon up. And they start descending and they come in from the bay because I'm looking right at the bay. I'm looking out the window right now. There's the bay. And they come down. They descend to about 30, 40 stories above the buildings. And they kind of zip around. And then they lower themselves and they get really close to the balconies. And that's how they, I first um, you know, started uh, capturing them. Is they got really close to my balcony. And that's why I was able to resolve them and film them in night vision. But today, now I'm filming them from afar, you know, from my balcony. But they're going around other people's balconies. And my June 3rd uh, capture is a very good uh, demonstration of that. Oh, and your June 3rd capture is off the hook. I mean, it's... <laughs> It is incredible. And that, that was the, the, oh my gosh, that's the one that you had, uh, and open minds did a story on it, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That was, um, 15 months before that. I had no sightings for 15 months. I was getting really upset. <laughs> I, I just, know because we talked about that. You're like, oh <laughs> yeah. And you know, and I didn't think I was ever going to see one again. I thought they're, they're gone. The flap is finished with, um, they've gone somewhere else, but I think it just has to do, I think they're always there. I think it just has to do with the time, the timing, being out there at the right time. You know, I don't spend eight hours a night in New York. I do maybe an hour to two hours. Uh, so I think that has a lot to do with it. And again, anybody wants to take on this, um, you know, sky watch for UFOs, you have to be patient. But if you do what you, you know, you do it the proper way in scanning the skies and you have the proper equipment, you're going to see one. I can guarantee you that. So you, I mean, sometimes I'll just put my, my night vision on a tripod and then just let it run. I mean, would you do that or would you suggest just doing what you're talking about, which is scanning? Or are they both well, good? If, if They're both good. I mean, a lot of people do that. They leave their night visions out all night long, but you're only capturing a certain um, part of the sky. And if you do get an orb that flies by or a UFO, it's only going to pass by that field of view. So you may only get a couple seconds of it. I'd like to be able to uh, capture them while they're traveling and seeing what they're doing as long as possible. Like my June 3rd video was three and a half minutes long. And I got to see the behavior of the orb, what it was doing exactly. And I knew that it was going to do that. It came from above. It turned around, changed direction. It descended and it turned again around a crane. And it came really close, slowed down in front of someone's balcony, which I'm sure came very, very close like it does to me, like it did to me about 10 to 20 feet from my balcony. So if you just have your you know, night vision on, uh, you're only going to get, you may not get nothing at all because the orbs or, or UFOs might be flying around uh, where you're uh, where you're filming and you're going to miss it. So you don't 
you can't say that you know you have your your camera out there for eight hours a night uh, or six hours a night for months and months end to end, and you're not get, catching anything. It's maybe because you're not pointing where they are located. Because I think they go to certain areas, uh, um, and they kind of like pick times where they go. I mean, from my experience, it could be midnight, it could be nine o'clock at night, it could be three or four o'clock in the morning. And it depends where they're they're located. Um, you know, there's it's a big city, it's a big sky. So it depends if they're coming from the north, the south. So that's why I like to be out there and manning the camera so I can check the whole skies out. Did, and when you first saw them kind of zipping about in close proximity to you and then balconies, that must have been I would have that would have been a very disconcerting feeling. At the beginning, oh yeah, <laughs> it was. But then in 2012, at the end of 2011, my very first orb, again, that one came about 50 feet from me. And this one was really, really interesting. And it had kind of like, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it, threads or spikes coming from it. It looked like a plasma ball, but it kind of shined with the um, um, with the street lights, you know, for the light pollution. But I couldn't see it with the naked eye. I don't, I don't know if you remember seeing that one. It was called the Amazing Energy Orb, I called it on my YouTube channel. Yes, yep. That one came about, uh, you know, I measured it because it was between the building uh, across the street from me, and it was about 50 feet, again, with my range finder and everything. I did all that analysis afterwards, so about 50 feet, and I remember at that time, I was I had my night vision. It was a, uh, a Yukon night vision device, and I had it handheld. It wasn't on a, a tripod. And had a small little monitor, you know, was on top of the of the monocular, and I was always looking at the sky and this little monitor at the same time while I'm filming, and there was nothing there 50 feet in front of me. And with all the light pollution, if there was something in the sky there, it doesn't matter what size it was, 50 feet away, I would have seen it. Mm -hmm. So it was completely invisible, but beautiful. It picked up beautifully on night vision. And that one, I felt when I was recording it, right away, I said, you know, who are you or what are you? I felt a presence like you wouldn't believe. It felt like you know, someone's walking by in front of you, 50 feet away, going, hey, how you doing? So I felt the presence. presence. And after that, I'd say probably a month later, I had some weird things happen to me. Um, you know, I had calls in the middle of the night. I mean, is it a coincidence? It could be, but I had lucid dreams. It, it was really odd. I can tell you that really affected me. So I was kind of nervous after that, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. I had some weird things happen to me, so I kind of took a break. Um, and I started, you know, sky watching again and right away, uh, I was picking up things within the same night. I mean, uh, a month later, like they were, they were in the skies. They were there for a good two years consistently. I was catching at least one every two or three nights. And it was, it was pretty amazing. And again, if you've seen a lot of my videos, I even captured one that was a saucer shaped. Um, again, I'm not saying flying saucer. It was just, it was saucer shaped and it was wobbling in the sky. And that came around for a three or four month period. And in my film, we go through a debunking um, episode there where we take balloons and we send them up and I was filming them and we compare it to that video. We had donut balloons, we had regular balloons, and there's no way what I captured, uh, which I call the wobbler, was a balloon. So I don't know what else it could be. Um, again, you remember that one? I oh, think I right, the you. wobbler, yeah. Hello, that's one of my favorites. And we, and on I, that, <laughs> I love all of them are great. And, and for all of you out there, if you have not seen Charles, Lamaru's website or face, excuse me, well, Facebook page, but also um, his YouTube channel. You need to go there because I think this is some of the most phenomenal orb footage that you can find. And we're going to go to the break, but I want to thank all of you because I can see my people from in the field are in the house and you guys are awesome. Thanks, Dallas. Thanks, everybody, for, for tuning in tonight and listening to Charles and Scott will be coming up. We'll be right back. This is UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. The phone lines are open now at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More UFO Classified. UFO Classified. With Erica Lukes on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. After this. The KCOR Digital Radio Network family this Christmas would like to join you and your family as we celebrate Home for the Holidays. I'm psyched. I know it's awesome. Starting Christmas Eve at 9 p.m. Pacific, the network goes commercial free, playing the best in Christmas music from around the world. No one should be alone on Christmas. 
Christmas Day, turn us on and leave us on. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. From the entire KCOR Digital Radio Network family, Merry Christmas. Ho, 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 ho. Merry Christmas. Ho, 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 ho. Broadcasting in digital HD radio. What if maintaining a healthy weight was as simple as drinking a cup of coffee? With Valentis Coffee, it's that easy. Harvested from the world's most pristine coffee farms and packed with the purest ingredients on earth, Valentis takes losing weight to a completely new level. At Valentis, we believe everyone deserves a chance to be healthy and fit. It's pure natural, healthy, and delicious. Click the Valentis Healthiest Coffee banner on the KCOR Digital Radio Network website and take the weight loss guarantee challenge. Valentis Coffee, simply the world's healthiest coffee. When danger is imminent, will you be prepared? Now many mobile devices can bring you critical information from local sources you trust. With the unique sound and vibration, wireless emergency alerts keep you in the know wherever you are. Learn more at ready.gov slash alerts. Brought to you by FEMA and the Ad Council. Monday nights are about to become hauntingly good. As Reverend Sean Whittington possesses the airwaves with Vegas Supernatural. Vegas Supernatural. Tune in every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern for Vegas Supernatural. Exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. There's a war raging between good and evil. The question is, which side are you fighting on? Tune in Monday nights as Reverend Sean Whittington sets the new standard for paranormal radio with some of the most influential personalities in the world today. Vegas Supernatural, hosted by Reverend Sean Whittington. Every Monday night at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The one show even the devil doesn't want you to hear. This is Reverend Sean Whittington. On behalf of KCORadio.com, GhostBegone.biz, and Vegas Supernatural... I would like to wish all my listeners out there a very Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, and the happiest of New Year's. May all your dreams come true. Good luck and God bless. Ho, 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 ho. Merry Christmas. You're listening to You're listening to, You're listening to UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a Sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. To be on with Erica, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name, KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or head over to the live chat at KCORradio.com. The audience goes nuts. And now, your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. Happy Fantopia Friday, everyone. I'm Erica Lukes, and this is KCOR Digital Broadcasting Network, and it's Fantopia Friday, so we have a whole night full of great shows, Restricted Airspace with Tina Marie, Hyperspace with Solaris Blue Raven. It's going to be a wonderful night, and I want to give a shout-out to all of my friends listening from every continent in the world, you are wonderful. And most of all, my friends in chat who are always supportive, kind, and graceful and can teach me a lot. And I love sharing ideas with you. And I love the supportive community that we all have together. It's very, very cool. My guest this evening right now, well, and for the next two hours, is Charles Lamaru, And he is an avid sky watcher, am- amateur astronomer, former skeptic, and now believes that there is something most definitely flying around in our skies, and he videotapes them quite regularly, has 
incredible videos. You guys need to check these out on his YouTube page. He is a friend of mine. He's got a new documentary coming out, and he'll be updating us about that as release dates happen here in the United States. And I wanted to say that Scott Brown is going to be up on the second hour, and the three of us are going to have a really cool dialogue about our thoughts. What are these things? How can you guys get in there and really capture some good stuff? So, Charles, welcome back. You were talking about the wobbler and some of your your experiences and how you were a little bit disconcerted at, at first, but then you got your mojo. Yeah, I got my mojo, all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah, and, and talking about the the wobbler, um, my first experience with that wobbler, I guess that people don't know what what it was and how it looked like. It was um, the first time was about four years ago or three years ago. I can't remember the exact exact date, but I woke up at um, three o'clock in the morning, and for some strange reason, I was um, I don't know I had to go on my balcony and do a sky watch. It was a beautiful summer morning. Um, the skies are, you know, clear. And, uh, of course in the summertime in Vancouver, you always get clear skies. So I want to take advantage of the, of the, of the night sky as much as I can. But it, for strange reason, why I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and I was drawn to my balcony. I grabbed, I grabbed my tripod with my cameras on it and not even three seconds go by. Um, there's a bright, bright object straight up about 90 degrees, 80 degrees above the horizon. And I, th- I first thought it was, you know, a planet, a star it was very, very bright. But it was moving very slowly. So great. I got all my cameras out. I got my telescope. I got everything. So I, I, I peered through um, my night vision device, first thing I have, and I got some great detail of it. And this thing was not only just moving and spinning, it was also wobbling. It also had a, a, what it looked like a hole in the middle of it or a dome. It was really hard to tell. Um, and so, of course, that surprised me. I, I, I didn't know what this was, so I started filming. It lasted about 18 minutes, and what it did, it's Spin, it was spinning and wobbling consistently. It wasn't inconsistent like it would wobble one time and flip around like a balloon or something flying in the, in the air, in the air currents. But this this uh, was consistently spinning and it was circling the city uh, about one and a half times in that 18 minute period. And then it picked it up a speed and just went directly north and then I lost it. So that that was a real big surprise to me and i don't know why at three o'clock in the morning and how lucky i was to actually capture something when i woke up at that time but more interestingly after that i filmed the same type of object about three more times after that over a four-month period and going at some going really really fast changing direction um and wobbling wobbling and spinning and even one of them looked like it um was semi-translucent it wasn't as like this one was. The, it felt like it, it could have been a craft of some sort. But one, uh, two months later, it was semi-translucent and it was spinning and wobbling at the same time. Again, it's it's in my it's on the, it's on the YouTube channel. Um, I still don't know what it is. I've had a lot of experts look at it, and they are like speechless. They have no idea what it could be. And and that is so incredible. And I have to say that I really commend you because when you put your videos up. I mean, you, you put them through the paces and you're very methodical about not putting stuff out there. If you have a question about it and I really respect that. And then you also, you turn to other people to, for advice. And I think that you've seen enough in the sky and you've spent enough time watching things that you understand what a trash bag is. That's awesome. flying by. I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, come on. <laughs> We we no. know what all these things are, and I I think that it, it's really important to to note the time you have put into this. And I, and I appreciate it. thank you, Erica, because it, it it is a fact. I mean, a lot of people will say, "Well, Charles, that's probably a balloon." Uh, even Chris Rutowski, when he had a look at it when I was doing my, my film, uh, he goes, "Well, Charles, it's pretty consistent to uh, a to a balloon, you know, uh, the way it's it's moving." And I. Well, you know, but Chris, you know, I've been doing this for, you know, a long time and I've filmed a lot of balloons, all different types at nighttime, in night vision with regular camcorders, um, with the naked eye, with binoculars, with telescopes. This thing didn't do anything of that. It, it was completely different. It, it, it didn't move like a, uh, like a balloon. It was, it felt that it was a lot larger and a lot higher. And first of all, balloons are not bright like a star with the naked eye. And I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I have not seen one before. At nighttime, sure, there's light pollution, but I've seen balloons high up in the sky, all different sizes. 
Um, with light pollution, it'll look like a dark something moving in the sky with the naked eye. You can barely see it. And it has to be fairly low, within a few hundred feet, for you actually to see it at nighttime. So this thing was really high up and very brilliant, like a star, like a planet, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning. Wobbling, spinning with a hole or donut uh, or um, uh, a dome in the middle. So I don't know what that was. And and for it to return again three more times after that over a three or four month period, and that's, that's pretty consistent of something that shouldn't be in the sky. Did you ever see anything larger that this object appeared to move towards? No, no. It was just uh, circling the city. And it all, like most of them do, they, they go towards the north the north or the northwest. They always come from the ocean side, um, which is the south-southwest, coming in from, I don't know where, Los Angeles maybe, I don't know. And they they come around and they stop in the city. They do their little thing. They do uh, tours around the buildings, uh, circle the city, and then after whatever, a few seconds or a few minutes, they take off and they go directly north. They just beeline. It's like, oh, okay, we had our time, or now we're taking off. And that's consistent over and over and over for the last six years. And you know what? It, that's really interesting you say that because that is consistently what I have captured here as well. They head the same direction. Yeah, it's like they they they, they have an agenda. They, they get they're, they're coming to observe. You know, you think about it. If this is a, a, an intelligence from you know somewhere else, um, where would they be? Unless they have an agenda for for going into the forest line where there's no humans. Um, but you know, come around the city. If you're curious about humans, where are you going to find humans? But in the city, you know, they may not be, um, I mean, I know some people that have seen, you know, the, the, the nuts and bolts types of crafts, you know, saucers and triangles um, and even big, 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 big spheres um, in the city limits. But the majority of them are seeing lights in the sky and, you know, maybe they're probes. I don't know. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of things that they could be, um, you know, I have some theories about it. Of course, it could be an uh, extraterrestrial intelligence uh, as a, as a probe coming from a bigger ship, because I've seen larger, like satellite type objects coming in from the same part of the beach, uh, or from the, from the, the water side and shoot things towards the ground. Yes. And that's, yes. I've, yeah, you've seen that in my videos. Yes, I right? have. Yep. Yep. And I've seen that as well. And you've seen oh, that. Yeah. And yep. uh, other sky watchers out in Pennsylvania um, have, have filmed these and they're very consistent. They're exactly the same everywhere. You know, it's it's like a satellite type object coming in from, you know, from wherever and they shoot things towards the ground. And I don't know, maybe that's the larger craft. It's higher up and that's all you see. All, all you see is a uh, satellite type looking object. And the things that they're shooting are those spheres or the orbs that are coming, you know, leaving at high, high velocity and they're coming towards the city and they do their little, you know, checking out the city. <laughs> I don't know. It, wow. See where the nightlife scary. is. <laughs> yeah. I see. Hey, Vancouver is pretty boring. That's why I don't oh, know. Oh, no, no, man. They're, they're coming from Salt Lake to Vancouver. I can assure you of that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's 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 an oddity. I have no idea what they could be, or or, or you know where they're coming from. If there is a, a a bigger craft attached to that, if it is a probe, I know I've been contacted by some people, uh, a near European Space Agency um, scientist, uh, aerospace engineer, and um, he's mentioned that they're, they're not standalone entities. Um, they're likely um, some type of holographic uh, probe. Um, projected by an unknown source. And he's actually told me, and again, he's, he's remained anonymous, and we won't go, go there about anonymous, but um, he's, um, he's told me that they've studied these objects, these orbs, and that there are non-man-made satellites orbiting the polar regions. And I had to, you know, question him again on this. He wouldn't go into any detail. He it just gives me little little bits of information here and there. But he said, you know, he works for JPL, NASA, and the ESA. And uh, I've checked him out uh, only because I'm, I'm a big fan of astronomy. And when we had that, remember that launch of um, that probe satellite onto the meteor or comet uh, a few years uh -huh. ago? Yep. Uh, the Rosetta uh, mission? Mm -hmm. That was his baby. So remember when that satellite landed on the comet and they uh, had problems with the harpoon? They couldn't get they couldn't get the uh, it landed in the wrong area, so they couldn't get the sunlight to get onto the uh, harpoon yes. of the um, you know the uh, panels, the solar panels. Well, I was getting that information from him uh, through the internet, through through uh, private messenger before CNN had that information. You know, I'm watching CNN at the same time, and I'm asking him questions. And this is his thing. And he's telling me, Charles, we got some bad news. This just came about. Da 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 da. 
uh, the harpoons didn't do this and that. And about five minutes later, I'm watching that on the news and hearing about it on the news. So I, 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 that for me kind of validated who this guy was. Pretty much. CNN was doing live TV, live with, um, with the ESA. You know, this is all live, all live. But I'm getting this information from him first. So he's the real deal. I think he's the real deal. I, I, I've checked him out other ways. Uh, I can't tell you any more than that because it would give him away. And I promise I wouldn't say his name. But um, he has an interest in all this. And he's been following my work. And he contacted me. And stuff that he's told me about uh, orbs, orange orbs, different types of orbs, some that are a mundane type of uh, natural light orbs, um, are very consistent to what I'm filming. So you got to put all that together. So I I was really boggled when, I mean, it freaked me out when he said non-man-made satellites orbiting the polar regions. And he recently sent me an email um, a couple of months ago. He had mentioned, Charles said, did you find anything, capture anything recently? Because we had some major activity up in close to the Northern Pole. It lasted for about three months and ended in September. I go, well, I had something in June. Here's my video. And then he sent me a response. He goes, that's the best video of an orange orb that I've ever seen, even from the military, military sources that we get. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I thought for me, that was a pat in the back because um, you know how long I've been doing this and how much money I spent on cameras. And I know for a fact, and if you see that video, um, if people are, don't believe it, have a look at it. It's an orange orb on my uh, YouTube channel. It, there's nothing else it could be. It's not a Chinese lantern. It's not a balloon. It wasn't picked up on thermal at all. Um, so for me, you know, I theorize it has to be some type of uh, plasma type object, um, you know, again, not emitting in any uh, heat at all because it wasn't picked up in thermal, but any object in the sky would be picked up by thermal. If it's a balloon, if it's a Chinese lantern, that would show up nicely on thermal. It'll come up as a black dot because I had it for a black hot and there was nothing there. And um, so, so that, that, that was my experience in June. So I was, I was really happy. Yeah. You know, and I mean, that is, that is, oh my gosh. And so we know that the, that somebody is monitoring the situation and uh, investigating, researching what's happening. How well, interesting. I, yeah. I get, a, I only get a response from him when I have something that's interesting that goes up on my YouTube channel. So I think they're, they're, they're watching my stuff. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's been about, I'd say, oh gosh, since 2012. So a good four years now that he's been monitoring my stuff. And I check my YouTube channel. I got over a thousand members, you know, that waiting to see if I capture something else. And there's a couple of interesting parties in there that are uh, sponsored or that um, are, you know, member to my YouTube channel. Um, like I won't say names, but it, they're in there. You can actually check for yourself. So I'm just kind of wondering why they're so interested in my stuff. Isn't that interesting? And I, I mean, I've had people reach out to me too that are clearly paying attention to what I'm doing. <laughs> Yeah, as well, which is always surprising. And it's like, okay, well, you know, I mean, I guess it's, it's a, a compliment, I guess, if people understand that there's some merit to what we're doing and keep track, that's a good thing. I, I just, you know, with with your case and him telling you all of these things and validating your work, that's really incredible. But then where do we go? Does he give you any input as to how you can investigate this more or? Yeah. Yeah, he did. He says, of course, um, these objects are known that they're, they're, that they're studying, that are not mundane, um, that are, you know, whatever, if they're ET or not. He didn't go into that detail. Uh, he went on with a lot of other things that I can't really discuss here because I don't really understand it. It has a lot to do with quantum physics and everything. But um, he did mention um, that a way of interacting with them, not communicating, but interacting with them, is, uh, he had mentioned, and again, this is up for debate what he means by it, um, a non, um, how would you say it, um, a non-conventional human way of communicating or interacting. Non, I don't know what he means. I'm, I'm thinking it's probably something like telepathy or conscious thought, you know, think about it. He says, he said, Charles, just keep on doing what you're doing. Keep focused on the orb. Just keep focused on it. That's what he says, because I can't go into more detail. But you can also use very, very low, uh, low hertz frequencies. You can actually interact with them. Some of them are known to interact with low frequencies, low hertz. So really? I go, of course, yeah, so I invested in, all, in more of this stuff. So I, I, you know, I'm going to be trying this out in the summertime because here it's, it's not great sky watching in the winter in Vancouver. But I invested a little bit more in some stuff. So hopefully you see if that's going to do anything different so where where would we go to get that equipment 
I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I just started investing. It's just basically, you know, getting a big speaker and um, just producing a pulse that you can't hear with the with the, with with your with your own ears because it's so low of a frequency. Um, and again, you have to really get a, a lot of power behind it and the big speaker so it can produce enough uh, amperage, you know, so it can produce that sound so it can travel. You know, if you have a little Bluetooth speaker, it's probably not going to go very far. But it's just basically a low frequency and there's a lot you can get on the internet. It's, people use it for meditation. Right. It's a little bit lower than that. Some of them, you know, the ones that you use for meditation, it's a low frequency, but you can still hear it's audible. But what he was talking about, and he gave me the frequencies. Um, you can't really hear it with the naked, uh, with your ear, naked eye, <laughs> with your ear. <laughs> naked you know, ear. Uh, yeah, naked ear. There you go, naked ear. Um, so I'm going to give that a try. I mean, I, I, again, this, this, um, you, you want to try just about everything because, you know, they don't come around very often. But when they do, they're only there for a, a you know, a couple of minutes or a few seconds, or they're zipping by. I'd like to be able to stop them and. Of course, I'd like to talk to him. What the heck do you want? <laughs> Pretty much. That would be good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But again, um, there's, there's some, there's some um, times I, I get kind of a little paranoid. Um, when I saw three big, large orange uh, spheres come towards my balcony after, uh, again, using my, I have a laser light. It's an infrared laser. Um, and at one time, about three years ago, there's uh, this one sp- orb that was very small about the uh, basketball size it used to come around the balcony quite often and just zip around stop and kind of dance do a little dance and take off well i was getting a little upset because he's kind of teasing me so i grabbed my laser light uh it's a laser but it's infrared laser you can't see with the naked eye so i was flashing it this object actually could see it um because it was playing with the laser as i was pointing it and i hit the orb with the laser and you know when you look through the infrared again it's on my youtube channel it was very small speck of light dancing around but when i hit it with the laser it actually enveloped the whole sphere and you can see it was like five times the size so it absorbed the whole laser light and i you could see the actual size of the orb so it was producing only small bit of infrared light that i can pick up with my night vision but with the laser wow it just it was huge you know, it was like a, a peach ball size, you know? So it's like this thing was zipping around my balcony about 50 to 100 feet. And I thought it was just very small, like golf ball size. But no, it was a lot larger than that. But you couldn't see it. It was invisible. That's very. Oh, wow. I mean, I've had so many different experiences. Like, again, going to the orange orb. Sorry, go ahead. I, no, I no. I mean, I just know this is so exciting that you're excited because I'm excited. And that I know that, <laughs> <laughs> that everybody listening is as well. But, but I think that it, it's... My gosh, you know, the, you hear about the conscious connection. You hear about um, different, you know, the lasers and different things. And I, I just want to say, of course, I know that my audience is intelligent enough to know you don't point lasers at airplanes, but, you know, whatever, just throwing that out there. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it yeah, is never. interesting when you, when I have, you know, you, you, Erling Strand over in Heshtal, and he's done such great work with his team, and they have done experiments and the whatever these objects are will repeat the patterns that are that you will do on on a laser and i think that that's it's very interesting so whatever this is does have the ability to communicate at some level oh that's that's interesting because that that makes total sense uh from my experience with uh using a uh, laser uh with these objects that came around my balcony because they would dance around and you'll see it it's on um my youtube channel called um um uh, I, I don't know, it has something to do with laser and orb. Um, and I can't remember the title. It was a while back. But they would dance around. I would move around with the laser, and they were dancing with it. Um, when I first hit it with the laser, it, it seemed like either that they were playing with the laser beam or they were trying to avoid it because I couldn't hit it again the second time. It was like they were trying to – it was like almost impossible to hit it again. It's either you knew when I was going to move the laser around or they're reacting so quickly that it was so hard to hit it again with the laser. It's, it was really interesting. Um, again, wasn't a bat, wasn't a bird. I don't think there's anything out there that can actually see a laser, or infrared laser beam, right. uh, unless it was something that's unknown, which I believe this was, was definitely unknown. Um, and after that, again, I'm sorry, I was getting to the point when I, after using that laser light for a good 10, 15 minutes, I was packing it in. And just before when I packed in my, my uh, tripod with my three cameras, 
three orange spheres just above the bridge from me, which is only about, again, two, three hundred meters. I'm just above the bridge here. Um, and it may have been a few hundred feet up, maybe a thousand or two thousand. It's kind of hard to judge the altitude, but they were very low, but they were huge. They were at least a car size each, and they both appeared at the same time. Bing, 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 three of them. And I was still on my balcony because I had just put in my uh, cameras onto inside my, my apartment. And they were moving towards me exactly where I was shining the light with um, the laser light on these little orbs in that direction. And they were moving towards me. And I'm going, oh, my God, did I, did I get them pissed off? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and they were huge. That's the only time I got really scared. Um, and I jumped inside my, my apartment, closed the, uh, the, you know, closed the curtains, the, bl the blinds and everything. And here I am peeking through the blinds and looking at these three objects coming towards my balcony or coming towards the building. And as soon as I, when I came back inside and I'm peeking through the blinds, uh, they blinked out one at a time, which I'd say about five seconds apart. One would, uh, would just blink out just like a light switch. Right. Uh, and that was the furthest one away. And then the middle one would blink out and then the last one would blink out. So that was very interesting. Oh, that is interesting. And I mean, I, my, my gosh, my, my experiences too. And I've been attempting to be as cool and collected when I'm <laughs> videotaping stuff, but apparently I'm still in that, Oh my gosh, kind of phase. <laughs> I'm working I on was, it. <laughs> I was, Oh my gosh. When I saw those, those three ones, because you know, they were huge and you know, the best, you know, way I can judge it was, you know, size of um, a VW bug beetle. That's how big it was. Oh my gosh. Um, you, you know, they could have been a lot larger depending on how high they were, but they were big. I've never seen anything like that. And they were a bright burnt orange color and they were brilliant and, and they were moving towards our building, my building. Oh so my that's gosh. why I, I thought maybe I pissed off this, this, this orb or the, whatever it is, the probe or whatever, whatever this object is. And and all of a sudden, here's mommy and daddy coming after me. I don't know. That's that's the first impression. That's a little creepy. I would have, you know, hit, I would have hid behind the couch, ducked for cover. But yeah. I, and I, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, it was it was really interesting. So I, I've basically seen everything except for a true, uh, you know, uh, legitimate triangle shaped object, um, nuts and bolts UFO. It's mostly been lights in the in the sky and my wobbler. That's all I've seen. And I don't know if I want to see a big craft. I don't know if that's the next step from seeing these lights. I don't know. A lot of people have telling me different stories. People that, you know, have had some abduction experiences, you know, and, you know, they've had seen lights in the sky and the next thing they, they were abducted. Um, again, I don't know if that's the next step. I, I, I don't know. I'm I don't. Uh, yeah, yeah it, it's it's hard to say because it seems like in some regards the it, the the phenomena is changing a little bit. But I think that the lights in the sky cases these are important cases and people dismiss them all too often. And I really think this is where it's at. And I have said that a million times, as have my colleagues and you. You know, this is if you pay attention, and especially when you get a lot of case sightings of these lights in the sky, you need to look at the data and, and figure out the patterns. But this is incredible. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to bring in Scott Brown. I'm so excited. Scott. Yeah, baby. And this is like the night of the orbs. It's the night of the cool people talking about getting out there and really doing some good work. So I'm Erica Lukes. We're going to take a break, and we will be right back. Listen very carefully. This is Houston. Say again, please. <laughs> This is UFO Classified, live every Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The truth is out there, just waiting to be discovered. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future. For more information on the host of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes, upcoming guests, as well as links to the past shows, visit her website at ufoclassified.com. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network, broadcasting from a shack just south of Area 51. Wait, that doesn't exist. This is the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Now for the news. Now, broadcasting in digital HD radio. This landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico. The rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. W. Brazil was the man who discovered the saucer. What I thought was a star began coming in my direction at a very rapid uh, rate of speed. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, 
moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. I saw a UFO and it went down the river, turned right at the United Nations, turned left and then down the river. UFO classified. UFO classified. No more plausible deniability. Fact. Fiction. Or the truth. You decide. And now, the new voice of the high desert, the hostess of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes. Welcome back to the second hour, and it is going to be a great, great second hour. I'm so excited when we can get Scott Brown on. We are going to do that. And Scott, if you're out there listening, we're having some Skype issues. So give us a call at 702-425-9230. We will get you on or keep trying to to adjust your Skype settings because we're excited to talk to you. But I am joined now by one of my favorite people and, and just a really laid back fun person who is dedicated to understanding what is going on around us and in my opinion is one of the most respected and dedicated researchers in the field with regard to all of this. I Charles, you were, thank you. Welcome back. I always have thank so you. much fun with you. My gosh. Yes, yes. So so do I. I just love working with you. Oh no, it's fun and I'm excited <laughs> to see you, you know, at the UFO Congress. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. Um, I, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm going to hopefully be able to bring, not have any any problems over customs, of course, bringing my night vision equipment and some of the other gear that I have. But um, I, I'm sure I'll be able to bring most of it. Well, let me know if you need me to get anything on this side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I definitely, for me, number one is having uh, my night vision with me. But I, I don't think it's going to be such a problem taking it to the U.S. It's bringing it back might be an issue. But it's okay. Well, you can leave it with me. That's it. Yeah. I know. I, I know. Ship it. Yeah. No biggie. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. I know you'd be very sad about that, but you know, <laughs> yes, I, I would. I know. Well, I'd be a little excited, but, but you, you know, with, with all of your research and, and getting into this and you and I both know that once you have a sighting, you, your life is pretty much for, I mean, it's forever changed and you, you can't Absolutely. get away from that. And how have how did you, after your initial sightings and you started to understand that this was taking such a hold on you, how did you process all of that? Well, it, it wasn't easy at the beginning. Um, you know, thinking people say, well, you just saw a UFO or you just saw a, a light object in the sky. You know, how can that change you? Well, it did. It really did. Um, especially the first year in 2011, 2012. Again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I was having some weird things happen to me the first month, um, having nightmares, uh, lucid dreams. Uh, you know, my um, buzzer would go off at three o'clock at four o'clock in the morning, three, four you know, times in a row. Um, you know, weird, you know, high, you know, strangeness things going on that kind of settled down. Then, you know, of course, you, you got to, you know, um, put all this into perspective, you know, that not only am I seeing something weird every second night or every night. Um, but you also got to think that, you know, this high strangeness things and how people react to you because you're, you, you change. I've changed. It was actually a really positive change after I got through that first month. You know, I felt like, um, I was injected with, um, uh, how would I say that, um, um, high intuition, my intuition just, I don't know. It, it's hard to explain and almost kind of like, I kind of know things before things would happen. I was really key on like, num like I was on all the time. Uh, I ended up doing really well in my job because of that in sales. But the worst thing I ever did was tell my experience to the people who I work with. My manager, he's not a big fan of that. Uh, some of my coworkers were really cool about it. But all in all, you know, um, you know, I, I had to because I'm very passionate about it. As you know, um, I kind of wanted to share. And that's the first and big thing you want to do is you want to share your experience with other people. Because like you said before, you know, you want to make sure that you're not cra crazy. Maybe someone else has actually seen something and they're just not talking about it. So it, it does those weird things to you. And then you become very, very obsessed, you know, and trying to find the answer. Right. And I spent over $10,000 worth of equipment. Uh, I never asked for any money. I've learned everything on my own. I knew nothing about night vision before I did all this. I knew nothing about thermal. Um, I knew nothing about any of these things except for, you know, having a telescope and a camera. 
Oh my gosh. And you know what? I've got to say that we're actually able to connect with, with Scott right now. And this is really oh, cool great. because yeah, we get to talk about gear and then some of his experiences because I know that Scott has had some life changing experiences that have led him down the path where we're all sitting here talking tonight. And I want to tell everybody that Scott Brown is, a, he's a 30 year professional graphic designer and he has beautiful stuff. You can see it in all of his work, especially in the field. He's always doing something cool and and he produced artwork and photography for Disney and the band Foreigner, which I'm just saying, we might have to talk about this because I Ooh, foreigner. Wait, I know seriously waiting for a girl like you. I mean, that's a little cheesy, but freaking hot blooded. <laughs> bring it on. I love yeah. it. And he's also he's been researching for 30 years and has a private Facebook group, which is my go to group. I think it's only one of the only Facebook groups I really, really go to called uh, in the field for active observers who are truly pursuing the phenomena and have cameras and can get out there and do things. And he also, he and his crew are very good at explaining to people what hoaxes are, what birds are, what you're looking at. And I, I really respect that because we need to educate ourselves. And that's an important part of the process to identify mundane objects. And Scott, it's so good to finally talk to you. Hello. How are you? We are so, we are great now that you're here. I have to tell you, it is such. It's so much fun to have the three of to have three of us together to talk about this because you have so so many experiences. And and really quickly, I wanted to talk a little bit about what led you here tonight. You had some early experiences when you were growing up, but tell us a little bit about that. Uh, <laughs> it's um, you know, I, I mean, I can't say for sure those things are related to it, but. Um, they were some strange things, um, you know, like Charles said, hi, Charles. Hey, hey um, Scott. Like Charles said, um, the high strangeness, you know, the, <clears throat> the weird anomalous events, um, just, you know, a lot of weird stuff. Um, and Erica, you probably saw some of it in the documentary. Um, and it, you know, I mean, as a kid, I guess, um, I, I mean, it's always possible. Like Charles said, um, the abduction thing, I, I'm not really sure, you know, if that happened to me, um, I can't say that, but, um, you know, just a lot of, uh, things that were just completely unexplainable. Um, and I didn't really think a lot about it until later on in life, years later when, uh, I had this one event happen to me, um, you know, falling asleep one night and I had the whole, you know, sleep paralysis thing. Um, that's a good theory and everything, but I, the, the strangest thing I find about it is, uh, that it was, it only happened those two times in my whole life and it hasn't, it didn't happen up to that point and it hasn't happened since. So, I mean, I don't know, you know. And it's hard when you have those experiences, especially as a child, to because you you look back on that. Oh, was that a memory? Am I imagining things? I mean, there's so many things that you try to discount them because I think that's truly the only way sometimes you can deal with things. Yeah, it's um, you know, like I said, um, that that point where I had that whole sleep paralysis episode, um, it was not a good thing. You know, I mean, I don't know what it was, but it terrified me. And from a, sh a short period of time after that event uh, was when I picked up my first book and began to look at that phenomenon for some strange reason. I mean, if it's related to it, it I guess it could be possible, but I can't say for sure. But, you know, like Charles said, the high strangeness thing, it's it's... I think once you begin to step into this field, you begin to notice things a lot more than you did before. You know, small little events, uh, maybe something moving, or I'll give you an example. Um, about a month ago, my wife and I were sitting in the living room watching television. Children were gone. Um, now, when you live in a house, you're familiar with all the noises it makes. Um, you know, every squeak, every door, every footstep, 
um, and the bathroom door began to creak and open up. Now, of course, me trying to be a come up with a rational idea, I said, it's probably the dog. Um, so I got up, and of course, the dog was laying down sleeping, not, not even near the bathroom door. Um, but, but strange things like that. I could sit here for another six months and listen to that door, and it probably won't move again. But it did it that one time. You know, so, I mean, is that stuff related, I guess? There's a million theories, you know, so. And isn't that, I mean, that's so, it, it's interesting because you do have all of these paranormal paranormal things that happen around you. And Charles was saying that there was, a, a his he had heightened abilities after his experiences. And that is a common theme with everyone I talk to that has had some sort of encounter. There's heightened intuition there, paranormal things. I mean, it, it, it's truly fascinating. And so I always ask the question, where does the paranormal stop and where does the UFO experience begin? Or is there a difference between the two? Great question. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it definitely all crosses over. I, I think I think they could be related. I think there's um, there's there's some evidence to that already with a lot of witnesses that have had both UFO and some like high strangeness at home. You know that could be ghosts or they call them ghost spirits. Um, you know, interesting. I'm I'm getting involved. I'm getting involved with the university Fraser University here in Vancouver on a four year study of the paranormal. Um, they got a big huge chunk of change from the federal government to do this study. Believe it or not, Canadian government. And I'm their go-to guy for UFOs, but he's also studying not just UFOs, but, um, you know, ghosts and also Bigfoot and uh, put it all together. So it's going to be really interesting over the next three to four years uh, working with this professor um, and with his students. They're all Ph.D. students uh, to see if there's any correlations as well. You know, I'm going to be going on the ghost hunt. I'm going to bring my equipment and look for orbs at the same time, you know, the ghost um, scenario. You know, are they related? Can they be related? You know, it's, it's it's a really, really good question. And same thing with Bigfoot. You know, some of the experiences people have, you know, seeing this creature, especially in British Columbia here in the Pacific Northwest, you know, there's some spiritual activity going on, you know, with the First Nations, with the Bigfoot. I mean, it's very interesting stuff. I mean, high strangeness, that's exactly a perfect word for it. Yeah. And I have to say, because of all of, all of these things, you know, the Bigfoot, uh, strange paranormal stuff. I mean, this sounds to me just like exactly what happens at Skinwalker and what happens in many, many other places all over the world. All of these right. different things seem to manifest. And I, I, it is very curious. And I think it's almost, it's really sad that we as people investigating the unknown and looking for answers have to cut off one thing and say, oh, we're not going to be credible if we look at this or that. We have to take all, I believe we have to take all of this into account. Absolutely. I agree. Yes, this is true. I know it's difficult though. And I know that in, when I was in MUFON, that was very, we had to make it about the UFOs and it's been very hard for some people to, even though you're getting reports of strange creatures and, and UFOs, it's just a fascinating thing. But I want to ask both of you, because you're so good at identifying mundane objects, if you are going to, and we've got lots of people listening tonight that are amateurs and they want to learn how to get out there and collect good data, what would be your advice for them? Scott, do you want to go first or you want um, to go first? Well, first I just want to say that, um, uh, I learned more from Charles being in the group, um, you know, from identifying things. Um, you know, I, I thought I had been, I thought I was pretty sharp at it until I met Charles, but <laughs> we, uh, we, we, uh, disagreed on a couple of things, but I learned later that he was correct in his assessment of this, this, uh, one thing we were looking at, and I can't remember exactly what it was. It was a few years ago. But, um, yeah, I remember, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's we, when I was really, yeah, getting passionate, really overly passionate about things. And I had a short temper. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> oh dear. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and, we and, had a little falling out, but we're pals again. And uh, he has yeah. a great Facebook group with a lot of great people on there. And I learned from people there as well. So uh, kudos to to Scott to have that group. Oh, I love that group. I was like, honestly, this is the place I go to ask questions where I feel comfortable, where I know people know what they're talking about. And, you know, we can all disagree, but we can be supportive in the end. And I really respect that. There, You can't find that anywhere else. Well, everybody has their experiences, right? And they all have their, you know, profession and they, they know what they're talking about. Uh, you know, Scott, you know, don't undermine yourself. You, you know a lot of stuff. You know, you got a lot of experience now. And um, and that's for a lot of new people that want to join that. And I, I would definitely, you know, tell them to direct them to go there um, because, you know, there's a lot of people with good experience that can teach you things. And, you know, if you're really getting right into it, you know, the number one thing I say to a lot of people is just, you know, look up, look up, <laughs> keep it. Keep keep an eye on the sky. You know, a lot of people don't do that. They say, I'd love to see a UFO, but they spend five minutes, maybe they look up in the sky and go, I never saw a UFO. You know, well, you got to have the patience. You got to look up, first of all, and clear nights is the best time, of course. Um, you know, get out of the city if you can. But, you know, look at me. I, I capture all my stuff in, in, in the city, but I use night vision and uh, digital night vision so it doesn't uh, glare as much as the uh, traditional analog type Generation 3 uh, scopes, which are really powerful and great, but not great in the city because of all the light pollution. So, you know, I would first recommend them to do that. Look up, get a camera, binoculars, if you, if you can't afford night vision, uh, even a good camcorder that has low light capabilities. Um, put it on a tripod if you want to film and record it to show your friends and, and to put it on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, but if you do have the money, and again, it's not a lot of money for a, a decent night vision device of like $500. Um, a digital night vision. If you can get one of those, I can guarantee you it'll open up the skies for you. Um, it'll take you a while. And again, that's what the Facebook groups are great for. And even, even you know, you can go directly to ask me directly on my website. I have a website that I'm going to put educational videos up uh, soon, probably next year. You know, the satellites, bugs, birds, bats at night vision. Sometimes they're very hard to tell the difference if, wow, is that a UFO? Because it sure looked like it when I first started. But if you're new at it, you know, a lot of people are still make it, making that mistake, you know, that a satellite or even a plane from a distance in night vision could look very strange. And even a bat or a bird that you would normally never see with any kind of other camera. Uh, and when it's up in night vision, it could look really phenomenal. Like, wow, that's a UFO. But, you know, you'll learn right away very quickly once you, you know, get the handle of night vision and how it looks like. It opens up the sky. It's amazing. It's amazing technology. It is. And, and Scott, what kind of – I've got to ask you, what kind of gear do you have? Um, well, I mean, it doesn't even compare to what Charles has. But I have a um, – I use a recon. Um, it's, it's a small infrared camera. It's a monocular Um <clears throat> There's a couple of things I don't like about it. It's a good camera to start with because it's kind of like a, it, it was, uh, uh, the advice was given to me by Allison Cruz and she said, you know, you should start out with this camera. So I ordered one, I got it and a uh, couple of things with it that are really not that cool. The resolution's not that good. Um, it's in black and white. There's no sound. So, I mean, you know, you got to be yeah, careful. Yeah, you know, like like Charles said, you, you even have to be more careful with it because sometimes it'll make things look like some kind of anomaly, but it's not really. It's something normal. But um, the first night that I stepped out onto the porch with it and turned it on, um, there's a separate button that activates the recording option. So me not knowing how to use this thing. I turned it on. Um, I don't know. I was out there fooling around with it for like maybe a half hour, 20 minutes, half hour. Um, and I was looking through it and I swung it back up over the trees across the street. And there were five, uh, probably, I, I guess you could call them balls of light. And similar to um, Charles's translucent orb that, that goes by the building, it looked like that. But it was a little bit brighter than that, and they were, they were like spinning in circles, like around each other over the pine trees, and it was like, nice. it, it, it was like they were playing in the sky. It looked like they were playing, and as soon as I swung the camera up, they dispersed in all directions. 
No. Oh my well, first, gosh. well, first I spotted it, but I didn't turn the camera on. I, I brought it down and I panicked and I was shaking and I finally um, activated the button to record. And when I brought the camera back up, they dispersed in all directions. And oh my gosh, we've got to take a really quick break. And I, of course, right at the good part, take it, but we're going to talk about, <laughs> we're going to elaborate on that. I hate it. But I'm Erica Lutz. I'm here with my friends Scott Brown and Charles Lamaru. We will be right back after our last break. Stand by. This is UFO Classified with Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. The phone lines are open now at 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. More UFO Classified. UFO Classified. With Erica Lukes on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. After this. Three guys, no ties. Reverend Sharpton's attendance is conditional. Okay. I was going to ask about Upon that. Upon finding someone to pay for his ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my ticket? Where it is? Where it is? And negotiating satisfactory <laughs> fees for performing religious services. <laughs> That's right. We are gathered here. Like, I ain't paid for nothing in years. Per se. Three guys, no ties. Wednesday night, 7 to 9 p.m. Pacific. Right here on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. <laughs> Ho, 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 This is Tim Beckley, co-host of Exploring the Bazaar on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. And happy holiday, Merry Christmas, and a mighty good new year to all of us here, to all of you there. Alien Deceptions, a suspenseful sci-fi romance thriller by Tina Marie. Featuring the tantalizing Erica Jones and the mysterious Russell Hamilton. An out-of-this-world book of fiction, based on years of document facts and files the government does not want you to know about. At least, not yet. Alien Deceptions by Tina Marie. Available now at Amazon.com or get a signed copy at TinaMarieEntertainment.com. Get your copy now. Friday night, 9 p.m. Pacific. Jump onto the celestial highway and travel at the speed of light into hyperspace. 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 Hosted by Solaris Blue Raven. She navigates you through the cosmic tides of mysticism into the world of covert technology, UFOs, mystical sciences, and the world of unforeseen forces. You get to really sort of enjoy a bizarre ride. Listen live, Friday night, 9 p.m. Pacific. For hyperspace. The one show that blows the whistle off our government black ops projects. Hyperspace. Hosted by Solaris Blue Raven. Solaris Blue Raven. Exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. Want to take a ride? Take a ride. Take a ride. This is the world famous KCOR. That's the only station I listen to. It was the night before Christmas and all through the house. Not a creature was stirring. Why? Anyone? 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 Because they were huddled around the fire listening to the KCOR Digital Radio Network, home for the holiday special. Brilliant! Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, Christmas Eve, it's commercial-free holiday music. Yes! This Christmas music! It's joyful and triumphant. Our gift to you from the KCOR Digital Radio Network. You're listening to UFO Classified with Erica Lukes, where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a Sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. To be on with Erica, call 702-425-9230. That's 702-425-9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or 
Head over to the live chat at kcorradio.com. The audience goes nuts. And now, your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. Welcome back, everyone. I knew I would have a brilliant night with my two friends, Scott Brown and Charles Lamaru. And we are here talking about orbs and different experiences that take place around us and how we can better use our technology to capture some of these things. And it's just fascinating. And I want to say, speaking of next week, I'm bringing on another friend of mine who's written two books about these orange orb sightings. His name is Thomas Conwell. And the book is there here. So this is going to be very cool. It's two weeks, actually a few weeks now, because I'm digging this topic uh, where we're talking about anomalous light phenomena and and, and all of this stuff. But to me, guys, this is it is truly important. And Scott, when we went to break, you were talking about the sightings that you had when you first got your camera. So just keep going on that. Uh, so, you know, I mean, you can clearly see it in the video, which is on my YouTube channel. Um, uh, one of these orbs zips off behind the top of a pine tree. Uh, it's it's pretty high up there. I'd say a couple hundred feet high. Um, and it stops, comes to a dead stop behind the top of that pine tree. And I kept the camera on it and it drifted out from the side of the tree and then slowly down and then just shot off to the right. And, um, you know, like Charles was saying earlier, um, you almost get the feeling that there's, you know, some kind of intelligence there. There's, there's something that's, um, you know, Oh, I'm sorry. Did I lose you? No, we're here. I'm here. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, um, a a couple months later, um, I was out filming. It was probably three o'clock in the morning. Um, and it was cold out no leaves on the trees, uh, slight wind. And I caught something as I was panning and it came straight down and dropped down and came to a dead stop on the roof across the street. Me automatically thinking, I thought it was a leaf that there were leaves falling and it was maybe a leaf. So I kept panning. And then I thought about it for a second. I said, all the leaves have blown away by now. There's really no leaves. So as I pan back, that's another separate video on my YouTube channel. The orb is sitting on top of the roof of this house. And as I put the camera on it, it slowly starts to drift towards the edge of the roof. And when it gets to the edge, it just bursts like a light burst it like it's I, I can't even explain it it's it the video is on youtube and it, it's it's very bizarre and it's, i haven't it, seen that one yeah it felt like that it knew that i was filming it and it was trying to get away from the camera and that's the impression oh. i got oh yeah and I, I i believe so i believe you're probably absolutely correct you know it was just a just that gut feeling that this thing did not want to be on camera and it knew I was filming it. And yeah, I, I believe you. I I just I don't know. So do you feel I mean have you ever felt threatened do you feel like some of the because there are two different camps on this. I mean there are people that feel this is a very aggressive frightening thing and that we should be alarmed. And I know it, it, in so, at some level we need to be very concerned and we need to be tactical about this because we don't know what this is. But then you have people that feel like whatever this is is just there to say hello and it, it's something that's been here for a long time. What is your sense on that when you've had interactions? Me or, or Scott? Both, both of, of you guys. Both of you yeah. guys. No, Charles. Well, for me... Yeah, I think, uh, again, I told you the story about those three orange, uh, burnt orange big spheres. That's the only time I really got frightened. And I had that gut feeling that there's something negative about that. Uh, But 90% of the time, it's been very positive. And they're almost like childlike, uh, playful, like Scott was mentioning as well. For me, that's, it's almost like your pet dog, you're, you know, throwing a bone and he's going to go chase it. It felt like that kind of playful um, when they come really close to, to, to my balcony. Um, so there's an intelligence for sure. Uh, they feel like, uh, they feel it's almost like a childlike, you know, or, or dog-like, you know, playful. And 
you know, I, I think like what Scott was saying that the they they know that you're filming them. They know. I think they have a connection with you. I think there's some type of telepathy going on. Uh, I, I've say, I've seen it too many times to say that that's just a coincidence. You know, why they come around a certain angle of my balcony and stopping in a certain area when they come around, perpetu- you know, just right around the corner. You know, when they actually have a good, um, you know, they're facing me type of deal uh, from from the beach and the side of my building, and then they stop. And I remember one time they, it would come close to my balcony over the roof uh, side of the side of the building, and it would be covered, and I'd be ah, and it's in my uh, YouTube channel, and I go ah, it's, it's you know it's it's gone the other direction, and all of a sudden it peeks out from that piece of that you know of the roof, and it comes right in front of my camera and it stops. It kind of like it's like it heard me because I was filming it, and, and then I thought he was you know I'm going to lose it. It's going to go behind the building, but it pops out in front of the camera and stops right there, and I'm filming it. I go oh, there you are. And so I think he knew I was filming it. And in this case, it wanted to be filmed. So there's many episodes where I'm feeling like they come really close to my balcony, like the blue orb. It wanted my attention. There's no doubt about it. There's how many flo- how many, how many balconies in this building. And there's a, a blue orb bouncing up and down from one balcony to the other, you know, 10 feet from me. And then uh, the first time I had one about 50 feet away with me from me and it was completely invisible. And it came really close, 50 feet between two buildings. And it's almost like it wanted me to, to film it. So I think there's, you know, there's two camps on it. I think there's some, they're very playful. They want you to film. And a lot of times they don't want you to film. And I've had some negative energy uh, at one time in one episode. So I don't know. And this is why I do it. I need these answers. And it's as simple as that. You know, what are they? What do they want? What's their agenda? <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Scott, I mean, do you feel do you feel like this is something that you could interact with, or like that wants to interact with you, and you feel comfortable with this, or have you ever felt frightened? Um, I, I've I've felt frightened a bunch of times. Um, I you know, I mean, I can't say one way or the other. I think I think whatever it is is kind of indifferent to us. Yeah, um, I, I don't think it's bad or good. It's just indifferent. You know, it just feels that way. And I mean, I, I I get this feeling sometimes that after all these years of what we do and what we look at and how, how many years that ufology has been around and people looking at this, and it just seems like that either we're not supposed to know what it is or it just doesn't want us to know what it is. And it's just, I, I, I'm not really sure. I don't know how to feel about that. It's kind of, it's a little creepy, you know? Yeah, it, it, is. it is. Especially but, you when, know, you, when you don't see, you, you haven't seen it, you know, the first time you see it and you don't know what it is. Absolutely. I think for, for me too, I mean, I've never felt whatever it is, is out there. That, I mean, it, it, of course it's, it's strange and I don't think I've had experiences where it's been in close proximity, like probably both of you have, but I, I think that it whatever it is, I've never felt threatened at all. And maybe I don't know what, but I know lots of people have, and I, I, it's just a, one of those things that. I, I wonder yeah. if you, the conscious connection, if you can, you know, like you look at some of these contact groups and unfortunately because of people's dislike for Stephen Greer and his own agenda and rap. all of yeah. that stuff that some of this contact stuff is getting a bad rap. And I think that's unfortunate because there is a very important conscious connection that we need to look at. I agree. I agree. I, I've I, at the beginning, you know, of course, I'm not a big fan of uh, Dr. Greer at all. Being that I'm in the healthcare as well, um, and just you know, just have some of his ethics and what he talks about the uh, you know uh, the phenomena. But you know, I, it took me a while, but I, I'm trying to learn more and more now that I think for sure there is some type of um, connection there to the conscious mind, um, some telepathy potential, and you know, these groups that this is what they're doing. Um, you know, and I think if you have a really good group that's pretty you know um, uh, with it and not overly. Uh, passionate about you know shining la- lasers in the sky at satellites and planes you know I, I all kudos to them and I hope they they get some good working out of this and get some good data um, but you know there's some groups you know and I had gone to one here in Vancouver which was just ridiculous and again I think it has to do with the leader uh, that puts on these um, these events um, but there's definitely some good data that can come out of there and uh, you know, I'm willing to go to one again, um, probably not the local one, probably find another group. 
or do one myself. But and I think you know, I think your intent just to go look for them. Um, now that I've been doing it for so long, it could be enough for you for them to get you know to get the attention from them because you're sending off waves because you're you know I, I before I go out it's almost like you know your intent to want to film these things and see them. And if they were around, I'm sure they're, they're, they're beaming into that and they're, they're sensing that. Because I, I'll tell you so many times on occasion that, I, you know, I'm sure they came around knowing that I was on my balcony filming. Because, like, I had many times, a few seconds on my balcony, boom, I turn on the camera and there's an orb. Where did that come from? What are my chances? And that's happened many times. And I think probably more of the ones I have on my YouTube channel it, were caught like that, were captured like that. Uh, and that's why I spent so many hours outside trying to capture them. Maybe I'm not supposed to. That was the time when they, they gave me that opportunity for a few seconds to film it. There's definitely intent there. There's definitely some intelligence behind it. And I'm starting to feel more and more so that the, there is some type of telepathy going on that they know, especially that blue orb, you know, blinking out the way it did when I just about hit record on it because it didn't want to be filmed for sure. Because when I came out, it was bouncing around for a minute. Why, when I came up, would it take off? And when I talk to me, <laughs> tell me who you are, what you want. But it <laughs> zipped off, right? And so either uh, I wasn't supposed to see it, but I don't know. He was getting my attention. Wow. That is, it's so <laughs> cool. I mean, I, I love this. And I love the fact that, you know, now we've got the, the, fact that we can afford technology and we can get out there we can communicate with each other and say hey how do you film this and what do we do and do you find that because of your group scott you've done such a brilliant job with i just i love you guys but do you find that you're seeing videos like this that people are posting from all over the world with the same types of phenomena um you know the ones that can be trusted definitely it's it's more of a you know, you've been in there, you know, the respect I have for uh, Harley Rutledge's work that he did back then when he wrote the project identification book. Um, I think that the majority of what people are seeing, it's a luminous phenomena. It's, um, you know, different size balls of light. Um, there's not too many people that are actually capturing like nuts and bolts ships, you know, like like Charles was saying it's more of a light phenomena. It's, it's, they're different size balls of light. Um, Allison has a great clip, uh, where they had a man go into the woods and he was communicating oh, with yeah. talking with her and two of the orbs come down into the trees right above him. And she can see them from a distance with her night vision, but he's right under him with a flashlight and he can't see them. And as yeah, he points that was a good one. up, the, the orbs kind of, uh, doesn't one of them kind of shrink away a little, Charles, when he puts the yeah. flashlight on it? Yeah, it dims it dims out. Even yeah. the infrared light that it was producing, it would dim out a bit. Uh, yeah. Either that it was hiding behind a limb or something. But that was, yeah, that was phenomenal. That was that was like, you know, uh, you know I'm going to hide from you, you know, or I'm going to just observe you from above. Yeah. That was pretty, yeah, that was a great film. Good, that's, good video. That's an amazing clip right there. I, I, it's, it's one of the most bizarre ones. Um, well, you know, you got two people there, right? And you got, you got witnesses there. I mean, even though he couldn't see it, but he was just under it. You can have perspective, right? Yeah, actually, Allison is with somebody else talking to them while she's yeah. talking to him on the walkie-talkie, and. Yeah. Uh, it's it's just an incredible piece of footage. I mean, you know, there you can't dispute that there's something up in that tree, and she's only seeing it with the night vision, and they're not seeing it. Yeah, and it, and it, it's just bizarre. And it's like her <clears throat> her area, like mine. Um, you know, she had a good five or six years of consistent, you know, objects that she was filming with night vision, and then it just stopped, just like me. It stopped for a good 15, 16 months. And, I, you know, I kicked myself going out there every night trying to get something, and there was nothing, nothing, nothing. So it's like they come in an area for a period of time. If they have an agenda, whatever they're doing, uh, whatever their motivations are, and then they disappear. But they're, they're, they're coming back. It's, it's, uh, I've seen him now. I've seen him two nights in a row now. Um, just the other night, actually, was it last night, Erica, or two nights ago? I captured one. It was um, two nights ago. No, actually, yeah. was it? No, maybe it was last night. 
Yeah, last night or the, or the night before, yeah, probably two nights ago. Oh God, I can't remember. I know, seriously, I know. it's been a long twenty-four hours. So <laughs> we had we had like a, a, a clear sky for a moment here at night. The stars were out. Oh, perfect time. Bring out my tripod, you know, with all my cameras, and boom. I was just lining up my cameras, you know, to get all three of them lined up together, and boom, there was an orb, orb traveling across exact same area from the June third one. And so I only filmed it the last three seconds of it because I, my my cameras weren't all aligned and I had to get it in focus. It was, it was a little blurry, but then I lost it after that. And it did stop and then it zipped off. And then I, I, I went out there for another two nights, uh, two more hours until the clouds moved back in and I couldn't find it again. So it's they're, they're definitely, you know, coming back. Um, and it's good. I'm glad because for it to come again, in just a few seconds, having my, having my cameras out, that's a good sign. <clears throat> And I love that. I'm going to get outside tonight and get my stuff going. And I think I'm going to do the scanning thing too, because I've been, you know, I think I've had the same thing where I'm setting it up on a tripod and I'm trying to look at one section of the sky, but I think this is great. And I have to ask you, Scott, because Charles and I had mentioned that when we see these objects, they usually travel from, you know, South to North. They're always heading North. Have you found the same thing? Um, not the ones that I've seen. They've, they've. Uh, they, I, I think they've gone in all directions. Um, but you know, like I said, I really haven't seen as many as Charles has. You know, so he's in a place where th that's the amazing thing is that he's very meticulous about what he does, and he picked up these patterns, how these things are flying. Um, but I mean. You know, like I said, for me, I they I I've seen them fly in different directions, um, but I've only yeah. seen a handful compared to his. He's seen you know dozens. Yeah, and I think it's depending on when um, where the because I'm come right by the ocean, a big 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 area like um, a bay. It's a big bay that comes in from the ocean, and they came they're coming in from there. So again, I'm coming. They're you know they're coming from the southwest. So as they enter, but if you're capturing them before they, you see them coming from the southwest, because they change directions all the time, and depending when at the time when you're filming them, they could be going east or north or south or west, encircling the city. But I, I'm lucky enough that I'm at a, a good perspective of the sky. I get the north, south, west, east, blah blah blah, and I I can get them when they're coming in from the ocean and follow them throughout the whole their whole trek when they're in the city and when they take off. So again, they 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 come around the downtown core, and then of course, there's some of them are so small. I see them going north, but they could be you know doing the same thing out in North Vancouver, which is across the, the creek there, um, which is a few miles down, and I can't you know see what they're doing. But again, a lot of them, even the the satellite type high high, um, well, I call them ships or crafts because they do shoot things out. Um, they're definitely. They just go one like a like a satellite. They you know they follow like an orbital path. That's why they fool you sometimes, thinking it might be a satellite, but they're not satellites. But they follow you know an orbital path, you know from you know from south to north, and um, but they shoot things towards the ground, and that's it. So um, and that I've never is, seen them. From, yeah, that's yeah, the I mean, weirdest thing. Oh my gosh! And I, I will say that we had a lockdown at Dugway Proving Ground a few years ago, and the same night the lock down was in place because a vial of neurotoxin was missing frighteningly oh. enough uh there were objects videotaped in the neighboring town and they were orbs shooting something ejecting something from them yeah and that's that's the oddest thing i don't know what that's all about yeah that's, but that's that's when it, it seems to be that we're seeing more videos of that or hearing more reports of that. Well, the one in Alaska was amazing earlier in the year. You remember that one? That was in June, I believe. No, not June, before that. It was in the springtime. Uh, and this uh, security officer um, was doing his rounds outside, and he captured this star-like object, and it was strobing. And he just kept on strobing. He, he was filming. He filmed a good uh, eight minutes of it, and it was shooting things down. It was dropping things, like you've seen a lot of those videos. Things were ejecting from it, but it was strobing as it was ejecting things. And it, and they traveled like an orb would travel as it's leaving that the strobing object. And you, I don't know if any of you have seen that one. It was shot in Alaska. Yes, it is incredible. I don't think yeah. I have seen that one. Oh, I'll have to send you the link, Scott. It's it's amazing. And I, I've commented on it. I contacted the, the person, and he's legit. And you'll see it in this video. You know, some people say, oh, he faked it. It's CGI. No, no, it's the real thing. You know, I've seen enough of these things. 
Uh, it was a phenomena. And what it was, and I even had the ESA guy look at it. And he says, it's not man-made. Now, I don't know what it is. Wow. So it's not a satellite. It's nothing that uh, the military were playing around with, even though they have um, a lot of um, bases around that area, of course, in Alaska, that do, you know, the, um, the red and green um, exercises. Uh, they had done one the night before or the day before where there's multiple planes in the sky and they do exercises, right? And the Air Force does that. But, right. you know, I can't see this, you know, a, a, an object that's still in the sky. It's not moving. It's strobing. It looks like a big star strobing and ejecting things and shooting and zipping around like what, 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 what our orbs do. You know, so I don't know what that was. That was pretty amazing. Wow. Don't you just, I mean, this is so crazy. And I think to me, just if, if you can get out there and like you were saying, Charles, what you do is you, you get out there and you pay attention and you learn all of the, everything in your natural surroundings, you learn about the sky, all of these things, and you just pay attention and you're just diligent. And there is something out there interacting with us and nobody knows what it is or where it's, if it's extraterrestrial, if it's interdimensional, if it's something that has been here, that's terrestrial, that is just another living form. You know, we don't know. I, we don't know. And, that, and I say that to everybody. It's like, I, I'll never make a stance that, okay, what I've seen, that's for sure from an ET craft, it's extraterrestrial, it's alien. I, I don't I don't make those uh, firm statements. You know, it could be definitely extraterrestrial. It could be something that's been here from day one. And that's the only reason why that I've spent so much money on all this equipment that I have from thermal to different night vision devices to regular HD camcorders. Um, you know, I want to, you know, eventually uh, purchase um, that Madar 3 device from your friend there from um, a Nightcap. It's developed an incredible device that would help me out dearly to know if, um, you know, if there's an object in the sky, um, you know, even when it's raining and I'm not out there with my, my, uh, my, my cameras, if it's picking up an object, because I think they're, they're producing some type of EMF field and there's some evidence towards that. And spectrography, you know, I, I need to have um, evidence of what this light, what they're producing, what kind of fuel it is. You know, if I can see it in night vision, if I can see it in HD, you know, it'd be nice to get um, a spectroscopy or a spectrogram. You know, there's a filter out there. It's a few hundred dollars you can put in front of your camera and you can get the different colorations of um, uh, of the fuel, whatever the fuel they're burn, burning. Um, the scientists are doing this. You know, Hestalman, they have this equipment and they're getting this important data you know, oh, they're, they're not seen incredible. As yeah, they're they incredible. Everything. And and, and I, I talk about it every every week. And it, this is just so so important. They've done the best work that I can say. And I have to say we're getting ready to to wrap it up. And I want to ask you guys, tell us about your YouTube pages. How can people find you and look at your work? So Charles, go ahead and tell us about that. Okay. Um, basically, my YouTube channel is just um, uh, YouTube slash Charles Lamore or Charles Lamb. Charles, I think it's Charles T. Lamb. It, Anyways, if you do Charles Lamaru and you Google me, I'm pretty well all over the internet. Um, but the easier way is I just I just uh, created a website. Um, it's called it's www.static8 as in the number eight films.com, and I'm going to be posting some videos, educational videos for people that are new to this. Um, you know how to observe and to look for these orbs, these UAPs, UFOs. Uh, and the equipment that I use. And for people that really want to learn and how to do this, and they want to buy a night vision device and, you know, what to learn from, what to look out for, you know, what's normal, what's, you know, what's a, what, what does a bird look like in night vision or a bat or even a bug or a moth? Those are very, very important pieces because it took me a long time to figure that out. You got a moth flying around to, you know, 10, 15 feet in front of you, it might look like an orb. Right. So, and Scott, I've got to just say really quickly about one more to show close. Scott, where can people find you? Uh, you can go to YouTube and put in just Scott Brown, or um, you can search me under Surfer Boy 55. Surfer, Surfer Boy 55. It should be a foreigner song, but I, I like that. That'll work. <laughs> <laughs> foreigner. But I love That's you right. guys. Woohoo in the field. My boys rock. I love it. So, anyway, America Luke's are going to catch you next week with Thomas Conwell. We're talking about there, here, about orange orbs, all this good stuff. Have a safe and wonderful weekend. Stick around for UK Underground, followed by Restricted Airspace. See you next week. Listen very carefully. This is Houston. Say again, please.
This is UFO Classified, live every Friday night, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the KCOR Digital Radio Network. The truth is out there, just waiting to be discovered. And now, if you will, accompany me on a journey to the future. For more information on the host of UFO Classified, Erica Lukes, upcoming guests, as well as links to the past shows, visit her website at ufoclassified.com. UFO classified. UFO classified. UFO classified. UFO classified. UFO classified. This is KCOR Las Vegas, home of the Digital Radio Network.